Good morning. It's Sunday, or it's the week ending Sunday, the 23rd of January 2022. And I'm Robin Jacobson, speaking from the Trinity United Church here in Vernon, British Columbia, where we meet on the still unceded territory of the Okanagan Silk Nation. Welcome to worship. In addition to continuing to stream our online services as we are doing now, we were hoping to begin gathering in person again this week. But because of this surge in the Omicron variant of the COVID virus and following the recommendations of our denomination's Pacific Mountain region, we have felt it wiser to continue as we are, worshiping only online as we are until March the 6th, the first Sunday of Lent. We'll go into Lent, all things being as good as it possibly can be, gathering in person through Lent and to Easter, maintaining our online worship service, of course, also, but hopefully gathering in this way. Hopefully by then, we'll have things settled enough to be able to do that. From our words to God's ears, dear God, please, this is our prayer. But for now, as we do meet, we do so in the wonderful name of the risen Jesus Christ, who promises always to be with us. And especially as we come together in the name of Jesus Christ. That's what lighting this Christ candle represents for us. The presence of Christ and all of the peace that Christ is. And so lighting the Christ candle, we share the peace of Christ. May the peace of Christ be with you. Holy God, we confess that without you opening our hearts and our minds and our lives, we remain closed. Our agendas remained tight and owned. 
but as you touch us by your own spirit, you soften our hearts and you open our minds and our lives to be receptive of where you are and who you are around us, over us, in others, through us, just where you are. Holy Spirit, that we may know your presence. Holy God, that we may know that we are not alone, that you are with us, Christ, that you are in us and through us. Thank you that there is nothing that can separate us from you and your love. That the worst of us is not bad enough to stop the beauty of you shining in and through even our lives. Holy Spirit, come. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Our reading today from Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through to verse 21, is being presented for us again from the Luma Project, drawing from the New International Version of the Bible. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee and a report about him spread th through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and he was praised by everyone. Remember what we said just two weeks ago about the work of the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit, we said, is all about creating this rising awareness of God's sacred presence. We spoke about how there seems to be at least these two different levels of knowing the reality of holiness in our lives, intellectually and experientially. It's a difference between an explanatory or an explanation-based faith or an experiential and an experienced-based faith. It's what I think I know about God and about myself and about others and about creation and what I am given just to absolutely know, what I know I know. Not just what I think I know, but what I know I know 
about God and about myself and about others and about all of creation. I know it because I know it. I've been given to know it. A deepest possible knowing. And so as our text begins, we are told that for Jesus and for any one of us, but for Jesus, according to God's Holy Spirit in Luke chapter 24, to be touched by the Holy Spirit in this way is to be receiving power from on high. It's about him and our being empowered to own the clearest possible sense of our identity and purpose. That both as individuals, who I am and why I'm here, as well as as a community, communally, who we are and why we are here, God's Spirit seals that into our deepest knowing. We can dart it up here, but not down here, not where it matters. Our personal and communal sense of identity and purpose. And we all need to be given that awareness. It needs to be given to us, kind of from outside of us. Because there's so much that's happening in our lives all of the time to mess with that awareness, to steal a sense of identity, to steal our sense of purpose. And we forget who we are and what we are. But when we are empowered by God's Spirit to know, what a difference. We spoke about Bishop Bill Burnett, whose experience having been a bishop in the Episcopal Church in Southern Africa for many years, he spoke about his experience of being touched by God's Holy Spirit. Identity, he speaks about electric sparks, electric, like electricity that went through his body, and this voice saying, you are my son. Who am I? I'm a child of the Most High God. Of John Wesley, as he wrote in his diary in the early 1700s, how after the Aldergate meeting, he said, my heart was strangely warmed to know who I am and what I am, to know what I know. Thomas Merton, also we spoke about how he was empowered on the corner of Walnut and Fourth in Louisville. He was just walking in the street when it happened. And oh my goodness, he has given to embrace this realization that he has the immense joy of being human, he writes. I am a member of a race in which God has become incarnate. Just staggered with that sense of identity. And if only everybody could realize this. If only everybody could hear that they're walking around, he says, shining like the sun. Richard Ray insists that that is his only real definition of a Christian. One who is spirit empowered enough to be able to see the holiness of God in Christ everywhere, even within themselves with all of our foibles. It's who we are. But we also spoke of how most people just don't know that, But yet in this text of today, in Luke chapter 4, we are told that as Jesus began his ministry, Jesus did. He knew it. He knew identity. He knew purpose because he was touched by God's spirit. He had been empowered. We told Jesus filled with the power of the spirit. Think identity and purpose. Returned to Galilee and a report about him spread throughout all of the surrounding regions. He began to teach in their synagogues and he was praised by everyone. Right at the start of his ministry, right as he came back into this area of Galilee to begin, filled with the empowering presence of God's own spirit. Clearest possible sense of both identity and purpose. And why Galilee? Why did he start there? This region, kind of 80 by 40 kilometers in the northern part of Israel, hugely fertile, good soil, water, lots of people. Estimates, they speak about some three million people that were settled in this area, 204 different villages, surrounded by non-Jewish nations of other religions and other types. So some suggest that the influence of all those other nations 
would have made those people of Palestine living well within Palestine kind of like the West Coast of that time. People that were progressive, open in their thinking, open to new ideas, open to new leadership, new influences, and kind of looked down upon by the more conservative Orthodox Jews of Jerusalem. Anyway, that's where we are told was Jesus' home. And it's where he began his ministry, in Galilee. We told, verse 16, that when he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. Different reports from that time speak about Nazareth as being a city, some say a village, some say only 200 to about 2,000 people. Some say more, they, they're not sure. But what they're very clear about is that the synagogue was the center of Nazareth. That's where the Jewish people went to worship and to read scripture and to receive teaching. The synagogue, the place where people came together. The law says that wherever there were at least 10 adults, there could be one. There was apparently this custom of inviting any distinguished guest that was in the gathering to read from the scriptures. Jesus was there, he was invited, and that's what he did. Come read from the scriptures and lead the ensuing discussion that was going to happen. So we are told that that's exactly what he did. We told that he unrolled the scroll that he was given and he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Touched by God's Holy Spirit. Think Bill Burnett. Think the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Notice how many years later, when John the Baptist was in prison and beginning to maybe doubt all of his suffering, was this worth it? Was Jesus really the Messiah? Because he was busy being punished and facing death. And was Jesus really the Messiah? So he sent his disciples to go and check out, go and ask, are you really the one that's to come or is there going to be somebody else? Jesus doesn't answer them directly. Jesus hears their question, but instead of spelling it out for them, he says, using the same formula that he used back in Nazareth in today's reading, he says, go and tell John what you hear and see. He says, the blind receive their sight. The lame walk, the lepers are clear, cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. The messianic formula, the messianic mission statement. Clearly, Jesus was using this text to announce the launch of his ministry and placing it within the context of Old Testament prophecy quoting from Isaiah. And then we are told in verse 20, he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the tent, and sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him, thinking, what is he going to do with this? Then he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing, placing himself as the fulfillment of, of that messianic expectation in your hearing. Jesus began his ministry by acknowledging himself as the chosen one of God, the Messiah, the Christos, the anointed one. It's him. And then as the Messiah, to make it absolutely clear, he gives them his mission statement. He outlines what the Messiah does. And what the followers of the Messiah do. Which he says very specifically, always, his missionary ministry agenda is to bring good news to the poor. It's to proclaim release to captives, sight to the blind, release the oppressed. 
even his ear proclaims this is the year now of the Lord's favor. As the followers of Jesus Christ, we are all called to embrace Jesus' agenda as our agenda. As the followers of Jesus Christ, I say it again, we are all called to embrace Jesus' agenda as our agenda. And if that isn't primarily what all of this is about, then all of this is missing the mark. Because this is the point. And we know that because we are given Jesus and his life and his teachings as the exemplar, the template, the model, the ideal on which and by which we have our entire life identities and living purposes formed. It's by declaring his mission, Jesus is giving us our commissioning. This is the plan. This is the purpose. Of course we can and, and we must own our responsibility to address each of these in a very literal sense. Who are the poor that Jesus is speaking about in this text? Well, it's the people that are poor. They don't have enough money. They don't have enough food to eat. The, the people who are struggling with homelessness, the poor, the physically poor, the physically captive, those who are in prison, and I bless those who are involved in prison ministries, who to go and visit the people who are incarcerated and hear their stories and listen and care and show the love of God. The physically blind, the oppressed. But surely it's also in a less literal but an equally valid sense, a true sense, an emotional and a psychological and spiritual sense of the words. Remember the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are the poor in spirit. He said. Could you also say, well, blessed are the captive in spirit. Blessed are those who are blind and oppressed in spirit. I think there's very real room for us to explore something of the tension between the physical and the metaphorical application of what Jesus is saying here. Our agenda to be somehow in that tension of physically and spiritually and emotionally and psychologically in every possible way caring for those who are in need. But that's challenging because it jolts us, challenges us to go beyond our own comfort zones. I say that because not all captives actually want to be released. Not all people who are struggling in these circumstances want what Christ is offering to them. We all know the saying that there are none so blind as those who will not see. Is it true? None so poor, none so captive, none so oppressed as those who will not allow themselves to be released. There is such a thing as being habitualized. We become habitualized to our circumstance, like those inhabitants of H.G. Wells' Country of the Blind, where everyone was had become habitualized to being blind. And so when the one-sighted person arrived and tried to show them their blindness, they wanted to gouge his eyes out, take away his sight, as if blindness is all that there is. Remember that powerful scene with, with Morgan Fairchild? I think I've got a little bit ahead of myself over here. That powerful scene of Morgan, uh, 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 Morgan, Fe uh, Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman. In the Shawshank, Shawshank is um, redemption. That powerful scene where he's speaking about the prison walls. And he's speaking about the fam familiarity of the prison walls, which somehow make a prisoner feels safe. The same thing that they've hated for the first part of their sentence comes to feel like their safety. These walls are funny, he says. First you hate them, then you get used to them. Enough time passes and you get so you depend on them. It's so very tragic that we can and that we do become 
so used to the routines of whatever compromised circumstances that we are in, that we no longer even desire to be freed of it. And so we'll not thank you when you come and invade our familiar space with talk of freedom and difference and love and life. Comfortable in my pain and my hurt and my guilt to not want to be liberated. I think of that paralyzed man in John chapter 5 who Jesus first had to ask, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be well? Before he was able to leave the familiarity of his mat and get up and walk. The familiarity of his mat. To what extent had he allowed the familiar comfort of his mat to become the walls that imprisoned him right there where he lay? Do we do that? To what extent are we so habitualized to our compromised circumstances that we actually want nothing more than to make our compromised circumstances comfortable? It's no surprise that in the next part of this reading we'll be looking at next week, how the people's reaction to what Jesus was saying was anything but friendly. They became hostile. How very desperately oppressive to suspect that most of us probably prefer to stick with whatever is familiar, however captive or blinded we may, attitudes and our postures may be. How very far living like that is from the life and the freedom of Christ's love that we are intended for, knowing and for sharing and for being. As I say, we'll be speaking more about that next week. But for now, as the followers of Jesus Christ, those of us who are consciously choosing, or, okay, <laughs> trying consciously to be choosing to walk Christ's way, let's embrace this time right here, Right now, again today, as our beautifully spirit-empowered commissioning. Because just as Jesus came to Galilee, filled with the power of God's spirit in order to bring good news, so we can own our place as the continuation of what God in Jesus Christ has begun. May we know that in whatever Galilee circumstances we may find ourselves. And may that result in our being better empowered to be the receivers and the bearers of good news to whomever, wherever we may be, and whatever that may mean. May it be so. In Jesus' name. Amen. God's Spirit is in my heart. God has called me and set me apart. This is what I have to do, what I have to do. God sent me to give the good news to the poor, tell prisoners that they are prisoners no more, tell blind people that they can see. Prisoners that they are prisoners no more. The blind people that they.
Dear God, thank you for making your mission as clear as you have. We need that good news. You know the extent to which we are the poor and the captive and the oppressed and the blind and the deaf and the dumb and the lame. We need that word spoken into our lives. Thank you that we receive it by your spirit. And thank you that you take us seriously enough to trust us with that mission to be your presence in the world, to reach out, to go, and to be. Help us, dear God, better to own that wonderful privilege, that most awesome responsibility. In you, of you, for you. We pray this prayer in the context of this COVID pandemic. We think of the people who are struggling the most at the moment. Struggling because of the direct effects of this virus and the Omicron variants and and the indirect effects because they're exhausted caring for patients or because they're just so lonely and so discombobulated, confused, so isolated. We pray against this pandemic. Dear God, we pray for some resolution and some hope and some comfort. And we would be part of your mission in this world that is struggling with climate change, that the damage that we people have had and have effected on this planet. We pray for an embracing of our responsibility, even as we embrace the privilege of living in this beautiful place, that we would take our responsibility seriously, more seriously. Thank you, dear God, to hear our prayer. And we pray for relationships, relationships between the nations. We think of what's happening in the Ukraine at the moment with the buildup of the Russian troops on the border, We think of the fear that must be driving that build-up, both from the Russian side as well as from the people of the Ukraine seeing what's happening. We pray for global leaders to be able to make wise decisions. We pray internally in the different nations here in Canada and wherever where First Nations people have been hurt because of colonizing practices of often well-meaning but not always. 
the damage that has been caused and that goes on even now. We pray, dear God, that we may be part of the solution, not part of the ongoing, ongoing part of the problem. You know our hearts. Holy God, you know what we are dealing with. You know where we long to receive good news. You know where we long to be your good news in the world. In your mercy, hear our prayers. I'm quiet for the next moment. And where you are at home or just wherever you are, holy God, hear our prayers. Thank you, dear God, that you do hear our prayers. We open our arms wide and we draw in all of those who are struggling the most and all whom you use us to impact with your beautiful good news. Even as we say together the prayer that you taught Jesus, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we turn towards the rest of this week, as all of what's lying ahead of us, may we do so knowing that we are not just people in a vacuum, that we have our God with us, and not only there to love us and to be with us, but with us to charge us and to commission us and to use us to go and be the blessing that he has started and that he has formed us to be. May we live into that blessing. And as a result of even our efforts, may others come to know how precious and how beloved they are. And as that is happening, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you today and always. Amen.